Phyllis Diller was a comedian from way back in the 1960s, a very, very funny woman. She was asked one time, if you had it to do all over again, would you have children? And she said, yes, but not the same ones. If your mother is laughing right now and you don't understand, it's probably a parent thing. Today is Mother's Day, and maybe you tuned in expecting a traditional Mother's Day sermon. It's not going to be that. We're in a special series that we've titled More. We're looking at the resurrection stories of Jesus Christ. For a lot of us, we only celebrate it on Easter, and we start to think that maybe Jesus was all of those resurrection stories happen in just one day. That's not the case. For 40 days, he showed himself alive. Easter was way back in April on the 12th, we're at Mother's Day already, and we still haven't reached the 40 days since Easter. And so Jesus, if it was happening now, would still be showing himself alive. He showed himself alive to a lot of people. Uh, Few were more shocking, though, than that very, very first appearance, which was to a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene. Dan Brown, in his book, The Da Vinci Code, says that Jesus was a feminist. Well, I don't know about that. If he means that Jesus elevated women in the first century more than anyone else was, well, then that would be true. Women were seen as possessions back then. They were looked down upon. They weren't even considered credible witnesses in a court case. And Jesus comes along, and the way he treated women was so different. It was uh, so surprising that even his own disciples were shocked. In the story in John chapter 4, where Jesus is encountering a woman at the well, the story reads like this. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking to a woman. That Greek wording there for surprise actually means just totally shocked. They could not have been more surprised that Jesus was talking to a woman. Woman, why? Because that was the culture of that time. Women were not used in ministry. Women were not referred to or talked to. And especially if you were a rabbi. If you were a rabbi and you got caught talking to a woman, it was like committing political suicide. And Jesus comes along and he does his ministry totally different than anyone else is doing it. Jesus used women a lot in his teaching. Jesus used women a lot in his parables. When he tells the parable of the woman who lost a coin or the persistent widow, no other rabbi was doing that. Jesus defended women. He had two close friends, Mary and Martha, and when they got into an argument, he defends defends Mary Jesus allows a woman to touch his cloak, and he blesses her. He acknowledges a woman who gives two coins into the offering, and he elevates her in front of the disciples. There's the story where a very wicked woman, a prostitute, breaks into a dinner party where Jesus is at Simon's house. And in that moment of anointing his feet and everybody else saying, we can't believe he would do something like this, Jesus turns that moment into a teaching moment. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus totally breaks culture of that time. He's in a synagogue. There's a disabled woman. And and he breaks culture by, first of all, interrupting the worship flow. And then he calls this woman forward. And when he calls this woman forward, she's been sitting in the back. That's where all the women would have sat. All the men were up front. And he calls her to the front where the men are. And then he gets caught talking to her. And then he does the unbelievable. He reaches out and touches her, and he heals her in that moment. No other rabbi was doing anything like that. And then Jesus had a large number of women inside of his ministry, followers of his that did all kinds of things for ministry for him. And and at that time, there was a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene. Now, now why is Mary Magdalene important to this story? Because she's the very first one Jesus appears to after he's been dead. That, that is so highly significant. Mary represents a lot of brokenness and pain. When Jesus first meets her, she had seven demons in her life. You talk about a shattered life. You talk about a broken life. Just her life that's in pieces. And Jesus heals her and helps her put all that back together. 
But the fact that she's used in the gospel accounts as being the very, very first one to see Jesus resurrected is not only shocking, it's also proof that the story is true. You see, no Jewish writer back in that time would have told this story the way it's told in the gospels. The women weren't used in a court of law. In fact, even when Mary comes back and tells the disciples that Jesus is alive, that the tomb is empty, they think it's nonsense at the beginning. It's a very, very special moment, a very, very tender time between Jesus and this woman, and there's lots to learn from it. We are in John chapter 20, and I'm going to begin reading with verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, She bent over to look inside the tomb. She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. She's there early in the morning to complete the Jewish ritual of burial. It was a real, real rush burial for Jesus after the cross because of the Passover. So she's there early in the morning now to complete these rites. Before the sun comes up, S-U-N, the sun was up. S-O-N. And she looks inside this tomb and she sees two angels. Now, this should start to bring chills to our arms right now. One is at the head and one is at the foot. Why is that significant? It's a direct image of what takes place in the Old Testament in what we refer to as the mercy seat. The mercy seat was the lid that sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Do you remember your Indiana Jones movie? In the Ark of the Covenant chest was kept the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments and some mammon and Aaron's rod. That lid was called the mercy seat because that's where they believed God was seated to dispense mercy to mankind whenever the blood of the atonement was sprinkled there. The angels on each side are actually bowing to God on that lid. Here in the tomb of Jesus where were two angels, one at his feet and one at his head, just like the image of the mercy seat. And the blood has been sprinkled. There on that ledge would have still been traces of the blood of Jesus Christ, bringing mercy to mankind. Do you see the the imagery here? I'm not even sure Mary Magdalene picked up on all of it, but today we know looking into that tomb and seeing those two angels was looking at the mercy seat of God. Well, there's a question from the angels. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? Well, they have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. Why are you crying? Isn't that an odd question to ask a woman in a cemetery? I mean, if you're ever in a cemetery and you see a woman there and she's crying, we probably know why she's crying. She's, she's grieving someone's death. The fact that the angels ask this, as if, it's as if they're asking, why are you grieving a death when there's no death here? One of the angels in one of the other stories asks, why do you look for the living among the dead? And so all of this is beginning to sink deep into Mary Magdalene's memory. At this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? And thinking that it was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Mary is obviously there looking for a corpse. She is not looking for a resurrected Savior. And the story wants us to understand that clearly. Why didn't she recognize Jesus? Well, we were told about all the tears. We've been told that she was crying, that she was weeping. It's hard to look through eyes that have been crying. Or maybe it's the fact that Jesus looks different now. He would have been in the peak of his strength at this moment. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that we are sown in weakness, but we are raised in strength. Maybe Jesus looks stronger than he had ever looked before. 
He's definitely not completely in his human form anymore. Now he is in his resurrected form, and we know that looks totally different. And yet, he's still recognizable if she wants. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him, and she cried out loud in Aramaic, Rabon, which means teacher. Jesus just simply calls her by her name, and there's an immediate leap in her life from sorrow to joy, from despair to delight, just by calling her name. Uh, Jesus one day will call your name too, and that same leap will take place in your life as well. Well, in this moment, of course, she suddenly is in the presence of Jesus, the one she's been looking for. And so it's pretty obvious she must have reached out and grabbed him or, or embraced him. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Jesus is identifying there's still more for him to do, but he's also telling Mary there's more for you to do too. He commissions her to go and tell. But I love that place where the word your is inserted. I'm I'm going to my father, Jesus said, but it's it's also your father. I'm I'm going to my God, but it's also your God. It's, It's very personal. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So what do we need to learn from today's passage? I I know it's Mother's Day and we could spend a lot of time marveling at how Jesus treated women. I have the privilege of living with an amazing woman, my wife. Her wit, her charm, her beauty, her wisdom, her insights are just incredible. It was a few years ago we ran into a couple here from our ministry, and after a nice little conversation, a lot of laughs, uh, we went on, and when we got to the car, my wife asked me, she said, what's going on with them? And I said, what are you talking about? She said, no, they're, they're, they're struggling with something. I said, I didn't pick up on any of that. She said, oh, trust me. She said, they're not doing real well right now. And it was a few days later after that, I encountered the man just by himself, the husband, and so so I asked, I said, by the way, are, are you and your wife doing okay? He hung his head down. He said, no, we're struggling with some things. He said, we should probably come in and talk to you. We need a little help. I said, absolutely, I'd be glad to do that. And then in a surprised look, he said, how did you know? The Lord told me so. <laughs> Listen, to all the men in the room for a moment, uh, we need to treat the women in our life exactly how Jesus treated a woman with respect, with dignity, with tenderness and sensitivity. Uh, When we treat women like that, we are imitating Jesus in our life. But that's that's really what not what the passage is about today. The passage today, the resurrection story, Jesus and Mary Magdalene, is about hope. I need you to understand the magnitude of this moment. First of all, Jesus had died on the cross for all of mankind. His blood was shed, which we all receive cleansing from, that atonement. And then Jesus is buried, but three days later, he's back to life. He's raised from the dead. Now here is Jesus. His his first appearance is going to be to who? To Mary Magdalene? Do you understand what just happened in his death and his resurrection, that moment of great power? He just ripped the hinges off the gates of hell. He just defanged Satan. He just changed all of time from B.C. to A.D. He is now the undisputed king of the universe, what the Bible calls the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And in that moment, what's his first act? To come and show himself alive to Mary Magdalene? Why her? She doesn't go on to become some great missionary that we're made aware of. She doesn't go on to write any books of the Bible. She doesn't go on to do any amazing acts of of miracles. Or she doesn't preach any great sermons. None of those things. So why does Jesus show himself first 
to Mary Magdalene. It's who she represents. Mary Magdalene represents the broken, the shattered, the rejected, the poor, the outcast of our world. She also represents those who are going through their deepest moment of their greatest sorrow, their greatest darkness. She comes to the tomb very, very early in the morning. She's just surrounded in darkness right now. As King David said in Psalm 23, he restores my soul. And Jesus is about to restore the soul of poor Mary. Yeah, inside this story, you and I are Mary Magdalene. Many of our people right now are in the midst of some of their greatest struggles, some of their greatest darknesses. I know that some of our people have heard the word cancer. I know some of our people have heard the word of lost income, of compromised finances. I know that some of our people, I know even the word divorce has been spoken. And some of us right now are in this moment of just our greatest darkness. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is what brings us unbelievable hope. Psalm chapter 30 verse 5 reads like this. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy and hope come because Jesus comes. This morning, where did you need the hope of Jesus Christ? Where did you need the joy of Jesus' resurrection? Even in the midst of our darkest struggles, we sometimes ask, where is God right now? Where is Jesus in the middle of our greatest tears? Where is he right now? In the middle of this virus that our country is going through, where is God? He's right where he's always been. He's right next to us. It, it doesn't mean that he removes all pain just because we love him, just because we're his followers. That's not what the Bible says. In fact, Jesus himself said, uh, in this world you will have troubles, but take courage, I've overcome the world. In this world you have troubles. We're in the middle of a lot of trouble. But Jesus is right here. Boy, if you would quiet your spirit if you would just close your eyes for a moment, you could feel the hug of Jesus in your life. It, it doesn't mean that it's not dark right now, but in a little while, in a very, very short time, he is going to start putting the pieces of our lives back together again. Yeah, that's the hope of the resurrection. Even if today I should die, there is still more to come. <laughs> 